Hello and welcome to Prohibition University. What we're doing today is a series of mashes involving malted wheat and malted barley and these mashes after fermentation will be used to do some distillation runs on the hillbilly still to make some vodka. Come on in. Now my grain itself comes to me from Cargill um, but I actually source it from the distributor in Saskatoon, Western Malt Distributors who are selling agents for um, Cargill. If you do not live anywhere near Saskatoon, not to worry. In your city, you will likely find a home brew store that caters to the home beer makers that are making their beer from all grain. Um, these home brew stores will be able to source bags of grain, 25 kgs, from Western Malt Distributors. Also, I'm finding that a lot of cities have got beer brewing clubs and quite often once or twice a year the members of the beer brewing club will get together and place a very large order of grain and it's usually sourced through Western Malt Distributors and so you may want to find yourself a beer brewing club or someone in the club so that you can tag on to their, uh, their large orders once or twice a year. Now I grind the grain in a hand turned um, roller mill like you see here and uh, these are available online so for example websites like morebeer.com um, will sell them to you for around about hundred and fifty dollars and all that's inside them is very similar to what you've been using here at urban distilleries uh, two rollers with rough surfaces one of the rollers will spin slightly faster than the other so the net result is the kernels of grain are ripped and sheared as they pass through the roller now what you're trying to do is um, not necessarily make a fine flour, you're simply trying to um, uh, tear the, the grain kernel apart so that the hot water will have access to the interior of the grain, the starch, the endosperm, and uh, that will allow you then to tear down or break down the long branchy chains of starch within the kernels of grain. Now recall that the malting process itself has activated or revived the natural enzymes in the grain and then subsequently put them back to sleep. These enzymes, recall, are alpha amylase, beta amylase, and limit dextrinase. And collectively these things work together and uh, take these long branchy chains of starch, break them down into their smallest units, which are C6H12O6, otherwise known as glucose, otherwise known as sugar. And it is then that sugar that will be fermented into alcohol. I do my mashes in a very simple stainless steel brew kettle. And as you can see in this picture, I've got the brew kettle sitting on, um, I call it a turkey burner. Um, I bought them at, uh, I bought it at Walmart for $50. And that turkey burner, in turn, is fired with uh, the propane that you can see in the canister in the background. Uh, this mash kettle, stainless steel, uh, made in China. Bought it at OntarioBeerKegs.com in Toronto. Uh, $239 included shipping right to my doorstep. And uh, as you can see, it comes with a uh, built-in thermometer, which is very handy, and a, and a very nice uh, uh, drainage port. So what you're going to see me do very shortly here is fire this brew kettle up and uh, there are three temperatures that I am primarily concerned with. I'm going to take my water to 50 degrees centigrade. At that point I will be adding my malted grain. I will then be taking the temperature up to 62, 63 degrees centigrade, somewhere in there, letting it sit for a period of time to start the conversion process to let the heat and the natural enzymes break down the starch in the grain. And lastly, you'll see me take it up to 74 degrees centigrade, where I will again leave it for a rest period to let the enzymes finish the job of tearing down the starch. Okay, <clears throat> so my water is now at 50 degrees centigrade, and it is now time to add the grain. Now we have to agitate the grain 
And all that I've done is I've got a very simple DeWalt uh, power drill. I went to Home Depot and I got one of these paint mixer attachments, which you would use for mixing paint or, or drywall mud. Works extremely well, cost me about $9. And that is what I use to agitate and to stir in my uh, grain into my mash kettle. Okay, so with the grain stirred in and agitated, I'm going to gradually keep heating the mash. My target now is a temperature of between 62 and 64 degrees centigrade, and once we achieve that temperature, I'll be shutting the heat off and letting it rest to let the uh, beta amylase and the alpha amylase and the limit dextrinase start to do their work of chewing down the long chains of starch. We've had our mash kettle sitting at a temperature of 62 centigrade now for about 20 minutes. And what I've done with my um, simple tea strainer is I've reached in and I've taken a sample of the, uh, of the grain mash and I've drained the liquid into um, a white ceramic dish. And what I've added to the dish are just a few drops of iodine and uh, this is the same basic iodine that you would buy at Shoppers Drug Mart for $2.99. And um, you'll notice what color it's changed. Notice that it's turned that's, uh, that liquid a bit of a blackish purple. That's the iodine test, and we've talked about that uh, in, in the classroom now. And um, basically, iodine in the presence of starch will turn a dark black purplish color and so what this is suggesting to me is that I have uh, not yet co fully completed my my conversion um, of, of the starches into sugars and so now the next step is to uh, gradually heat my uh, mash kettle up to 72 74 degrees centigrade and at that temperature the uh, alpha amylase will really kick into high gear and will complete the job of converting the starch into sugar. Here we are. Um, we've held it at 63, 62 centigrade for uh, 20, 25 minutes. I then gradually increased the temperature to um, between 72 and 73 degrees centigrade. I've been holding it now for 30 minutes and I want to draw your attention to something. I took some liquid out of the brew kettle, strained it through the, uh, the uh, tea strainer added a couple drops of iodine. Now I want you to notice what color it is. You'll notice that I'm no longer getting that blackish uh, color. It is, it is remaining brown in color. That tells me that um, I have got uh, conversion of, of starch. Now there is one other test that I can do and that is using this device and you have used it here in the workshop uh, at Urban Distilleries. Uh, that is the refractometer. You simply put a few drops of liquid on the lens, you close the lid, and this whole thing is predicated on the refraction of light. There is an ocular scale in the eyepiece. You simply hold it up to the light, you look through the eyepiece. That scale in there has been calibrated so that if you were to put a few drops of water on the lens, you would get a reading on the scale of zero. And as you add sugar to that liquid that you're putting on the uh, eyepiece, you're going to get a higher and higher reading. What I'm looking for is a reading um, as close as I can get to uh, 20 or 21 bricks. And for those of you that are home brewers and are, and are more accustomed to taking specific gravity readings in a graduated cylinder, um, take the bricks reading on the refractometer, multiply it by four. So for example, if you had 20 bricks, uh, 20 times four is 80 to a home brewer, that would be the equivalent of a starting gravity of 1080. Here we are. We have got complete conversion of the uh, starches into fermentable sugar. I did a quick reading on the refractometer and I have got 20 bricks, which is really what I'm aiming for. So now we can begin the process of recovering that fermentable sugary sweet liquid from the brew kettle. What I'm going to first do is open the valve on the brew kettle and let the liquid come out. As I run the, li the liquid down in the uh, brew kettle, I'm going to be adding some hot water. And I've simply heated this up on the turkey burner 
and that water is about uh, 78 degrees centigrade and I will use that water then to complete flushing all of those beautiful fermentable sugars off of the uh, bed of grain in the brew kettle. So here go we. Now the art of adding hot water to complete the flush is something that you have not seen here at Urban Distilleries and you're not going to see it because at Urban Distilleries, uh, Mr. Urban uh, will take the contents of his mash, cool it down to 30 degrees centigrade and add the yeast. What I'm doing here with this addition of water to, to flush is called sparging and that is the technique that beer makers will use. That's also the technique that um, all of those Scotch distillers in Scotland uh, will use as well, sparging. So here we are. We have um, completely sparged all of that uh, fermentable sugary liquid off the grains. And all that's left in the brew kettle then is the bed of grain. And what I've got sitting uh, down here is uh, approximately 20, well, it looks like it's about 22 liters of that fermentable sugary liquid. We're going to get that cooled down to 30 degrees C and at that point we're going to add our yeast and let the process of fermentation begin. Okay, now it's time to um, add the yeast. We've managed to get our, our uh, solution of fermentable sugar liquid down to 30 degrees centigrade and uh, a quick word about yeast. I use a yeast from White Labs in California and it is simply their vodka distiller's yeast. I've been using it for quite some time. Very, very happy with the product. Gives good fermentation, gives a very clean taste profile. And I will add to my 20 liters of fermentable wort. I'm going to add, I don't know if you can see it here, about 11 grams, 10 or 11 grams of, uh, of yeast that I have simply weighed out uh, on my digital scale. To give the fermentation a bit of a kick in the pants and to get it up and running properly, re recall that yeast, when you first add it to your wort, will appear to do nothing. That's the lag phase. What the yeast is doing during the lag phase is, is it's looking for oxygen in your liquid. It's using that oxygen to strengthen yeah, the cell walls, because remember that yeast will absorb the fermentable sugar uh, through its cell walls, and so these cell walls have to be elastic, plastic, supple, in good condition in order to absorb the sugar so that the emden meyerhoff parnass glycolytic pathway can get off to a good start. And so, in addition to absorbing oxygen out of your wort, those yeasts are going to be looking for nutrients, they're going to be looking for some of the minerals that are in your water, and once they have uh, feasted on those and strengthened their cell walls, then the exponential phase occurs. Recall that Saccharomyces cerevisiae is going to bud um, by making daughter products, and these daughters are essentially a mirror image of the parent, and the literature tells us that a healthy yeast is capable of producing approximately 20 daughters and then each of those daughters in turn will produce approximately another 20 of their own daughters. And so during that exponential phase you have this rapid growth in yeast cell population and those cells then are going to start absorbing all of that fermentable sugar through their cell walls and generating CO2. The whole family of alcohols, methanol, um, ethyl acetate, ethanol, the good stuff, propanol, butanol, and so on. And in addition, the yeast is going to produce fatty acids, esters, aldehydes, otherwise known as flavor. And so you're going to get that whole family coming out of a ferment. And then as distillers, it is up to us to decide which of those family members we wish to capture. And uh, if you're making a vodka, of course, you're going to want to capture the uh, ethanol primarily, if you're making a whiskey, a brandy, um, an eau de vie, a grappa, you're going to want to capture some of those other flavorful elements of the alcoholic family. And my ferments will take me approximately seven or eight days and I simply do them in a, 
in a plastic fermentation bucket and uh, it's been working very very well for me I like to keep the surrounding room um, you know 23 24 degrees if I can possibly do it um, because don't forget that yeast will generate heat during the ferment it is an exothermic reaction and that's about it so thank you very much for watching this short little video have a great day take care